Thanks, guys. Thanks, Gabe. Um, you know, I have said this every single year that we've done the relationship series, but I'll say it again. This is by far my favorite series that we do, and I am so excited for it every year. Like, almost like annoying, annoyingly excited, like too excited. Um, but I love doing it. I'm so thankful to get to be a part of it. And just to let you guys know, I just, um, just to brag on Gabe for a second, because Gabe and Cecilia are awesome, and we are so blessed to have them as our leaders here. But um, it wasn't the original plan for me to be giving this message tonight. Um, we didn't really know what we were gonna do exactly, but uh, I maybe just would, would come up and talk for a little bit or answer some questions or something like that. But, but after last week, how many of you guys were here last week for Gabe's Men Talk? Was that not amazing? That was awesome, um, and I was so pumped. I got so amped after that. I went home and I couldn't chill out. I was just so excited about what God was doing and how he spoke through Gabe that I texted him late that night and I just said, dude, if, if you're cool with it, I'll take the message next week. And, um, and how great is Gabe that he just said, yeah, you got it, it's gonna be awesome. And, and that was the whole conversation. So I'm so thankful to have a leader here and a pastor here um, that, that supports me in getting to do this and um, just like what encouragement that, that they are and an example to me, so it's awesome. Um, so I'm so excited to get to be doing this message and, and I need to let you know that, that it wasn't, um, my desire to do it wasn't because it was like, man, let me up there, I can do it better or anything like that. In fact, God has done nothing but show me this week how incredibly inadequate I am and how unqualified I am to teach on this. But that's what's so cool about God and how he uses us. And Gabe will be the first one to tell you that last week was totally God. That was the Holy Spirit just doing amazing things in here. And so that's my desire too. So before we get started, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for bringing everyone together here and that every single person who is here, you have here for a purpose. You brought them here um, with a design, with a purpose. And so, Holy Spirit, I just thank you for your presence here. I pray that you would come in power tonight. I pray that you would do absolutely everything that you desire to do. I pray that male or female, our hearts would be open tonight just to hear from your word, that you would speak, that I would just be a tool in your hands, and that you would say everything that you want to say. Accomplish all of your purposes, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, I love the intro that, that the guys are doing for this series, kind of going out and asking people these questions. You know, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? We're gonna have some more as we go throughout the series. Um, you know, what does society call, you know, being a woman? And you look at that, and that is a super hard question. I mean, we asked, you know, 10 different people, we got 10 different answers. And I was thinking about that, you know, if I didn't have some idea of what the biblical answer is that we're gonna talk about tonight, I don't know how I would answer that question. What makes a woman a woman? I mean, it's, it's like, okay, anatomy, but <laughs> like, what else beyond that do you, do you say? I, I really don't know how I would answer that. And then the even harder one when it comes to what is, what is, how does society or our culture define that? I mean, you saw a million different answers just now as well. And I think women, you can totally identify that as we just don't know. This is a moving target, isn't it? It is a moving target that we're never gonna hit the bullseye on, but we sure try, don't we? Uh, you know, you're supposed to be, uh, you know, really smart, but, but not too smart, because that's intimidating, and, and like it, it said in the video, you know, you're supposed to be too sexy, but not too sexy, or, you know, be sexy, but not so, not like slutty, you know, you can't, you can't get uh, across the line there. You're supposed to have a certain body type, you're supposed to have a certain attitude, you're supposed to be a great mom, or be ready to be a great mom, a great wife, a great cook, um, I like how, I think one of the girls said, you know, something about uh, a woman being defined like in the kitchen and it's like, oh boy, I'm in so much trouble then because like that is the least used room in my house. So, yeah, but, but okay, so, so what is it? Is that something, is that a standard that I need to live up to better? And then look at just when it comes to body type or body image. I mean, this thing is the most moving target of all, isn't it? You look at, um, you know, a couple hundred years ago, it was very, uh, you know, in style. Uh, body type is just another trend. And it was, it was um, in style, I guess you could say, to be like a, a more plump, curvy woman. 
Um, it's changed a ton just, you know, in the 32 years that I've been around, we've seen, um, you know, it's okay to be curvy, that's good. Then it was, no, be super, super thin, like stick figure thin. And then uh, we started to, you know, see models that were too thin and we cried out against that, thankfully. But now the pendulum, have you noticed, it's swinging these last couple years. Now it's coming to like, you've gotta be super fit. Like six pack on the girls, you know, like guns fit. And so you see like this huge movement in CrossFit and, and, and all of these different, you know, gym programs, that kind of thing. And, and look at the biggest, uh, one of the biggest pop songs last year um, was all about butts. <laughs> it's all about having a big butt, you know, we're supposed to be all about that base now. So it was skinny and you're like, man, I was working really hard to get skinny, but it just shifted now, I'm supposed to be super thin or super fit, but I'm also supposed to have a big butt and I don't really know how to pull all this off. I mean, Kim Kardashian was all over that one. She tried to break the internet with her butt and Okay, I'm not gonna say anything that I was gonna say about them. <laughs> but you know, what, you, what do you do? There's all these things, you're supposed to fit these different molds, the mold's changing all the time. So say you maybe work really, really hard to get close, well it just changes on you. Same as, you know, clothing style, fashion, that kind of thing. And so, if our culture's definition of what it looks like or what it means to be a woman is always changing, and it's this target that we can't hit, then is there really a way that we can know a definite answer? I mean, we gotta get on some, some foundation here, right? Well, that's what I wanna talk about tonight. That's what we wanna dive into is, is what does it mean to be, what is, it, what is the identity of a woman? And I think that since God created women, um, that we should go and see what he has to say about it. Um, so we're just gonna dive right in, right at the very beginning, Genesis chapter one. Genesis 1, 26. Uh, we see God here saying, uh, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and we see plural here, let us. He's, this just shows you that the Trinity has always existed. So here we already have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God is saying, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. So here we get to see two really big things, and like I said, since God made the first woman, since God created women, then I think we can let God define what it means to be a woman, right? We get to see here that God gives women, uh, gives the woman her identity. It says uh, multiple times, just in this small section, that we are created in his image. Three times he hits that, that's gotta mean it's really, really important. So we as women are given our identity as image bearers of God. We bear the image of God himself to the people, to the world around us. And the other important thing in this is that we see that he created both male and female in his image. And so this shows us that there is equality, that we are both equally, male and female, image bearers of God. There is no uh, you know, one greater than the other here at all. There's no subservient thing, there's no, um, you know, all those things that, that we kinda like to connotate about what, what God says. No, male and female, he created them to be image bearers of God. And then if we dig down even a little bit farther, we get to see, just in the next chapter, uh, an even more detailed account of the purpose of woman, as Genesis shows us, as God uh, created the woman, we get to see, I guess, a more up-close account in Genesis chapter two, verse 18. It says that the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone, so I will make a helper suitable for him. And I really wanna talk about this verse because the, the big word in this verse is helper. And in our language, in our culture, the way that we think about that, we have too narrow or too small of an understanding of that word helper. And so to us, this kind of looks, it can read like, it wasn't good for the man to be alone, so God was like, here is a little assistant for you. But 
What we need to see and understand here is that this word um, just has so much of a richer meaning. It's not some, it's not some go grab me a beer and make me a sandwich helper, you know, kind of definition. Um, this is where the English English language is just kind of too too narrow. And so, uh, is the original is is in Hebrew, and the original word is acer, and I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but um, that is. Uh, got a much deeper definition, and it means it's a very powerful kind of help. It's a very valuable strength. And so it's a really big word that's loaded with strength, and this is a very um, valuable, powerful, important kind of help. Not some weak, little assisting help. But let's think about it logically, too, just for a minute. That, you know, why would we think that helping someone is a weak thing anyway? There's no meekness or weakness about that. I mean, if you are helping someone, um, helping is providing strength to one who is weak, someone who needs it. And so, you know, I've told you guys before, I'm super mechanically challenged, so when something breaks at my house, I've got my plus and my minus screwdriver, right, and my little hammer, and, and I don't know what I'm looking at. And so I've gotta call somebody, I've gotta call a friend or a professional to come and fix whatever's broken, because I don't know what I'm doing. Them coming to help me is not weak at all, is it? I'm the weak one, I need help. They're the strong one, they're coming to give me the help that I need. They have the expertise that I need, the ability that I need. And so what God's saying here is, is really it's not good for the man to do this on his own, he needs some help that very powerful, rich kind of help. And just to, just to note this, 16 times in the Old Testament, God is referenced as a helper. And in John 14, six, the Holy Spirit is described as our helper. Ladies, don't get carried away with that. I'm not saying we're on par with God, but I'm telling you, it's obviously not a meek or weak thing when God himself is referred to as also being a helper. And I think this thing is so beautiful when you see it in the context of marriage like God talks about and and what uh, Gabe and Cecilia are gonna get more into in a couple weeks. But you get this really beautiful cycle how this works. Um, When the man leads and loves the church, we talked about that a little bit last week, that's that's his role to lead, or lead and love his, his wife, I'm sorry, as just like Christ loves the church. So when you see the man doing that, Um, it's really a lot easier, the wife respects him, she enjoys helping him, her help and her respect just encourages him then to continue to lead and love well. And so you see how this cycle works as God created it, being these two complementing partners that work together in this unity and there's a lot of love and there's a lot of uh, just harmony in that, there's no issue, right? They just feed each other in their roles. I think it's awesome, it's so beautiful. It's just like the body of Christ, right? Like we are a part of the body of Christ here. Jesus is the head of the church, the whole church across the world. Each one of us is, you know, some of us are a foot, a hand, a nose, an eye, that kind of thing. Um, We all have different roles that we have been given by God to function together in this body of Christ under, under his headship. And so when we function together, then we better do what it is that God has called us to do. And so I wanna take a time out here because I wanna talk to the single ladies just for a second because I know where your head is at because I'm with you. And you're going, well, that's all great and cool, I get that, but I don't have anyone to be a helper to right now, so what am I supposed to do? And I really want you to hear that uh, don't sit around and wait for that. Don't wait until you have someone to be a helper to. Your identity is still clear. You are meant to bear the image of God in this world. You are meant to have that purpose of helping. You are meant for that purpose of what God has called you to do. He's given each of you very specific spiritual gifts and talents, and you should go and use them. Don't say, okay, great, I got it. I'll do that once I get married. Go out seek Jesus, fall more in love with him, and do what it is that he's called you to do. When he wants to bring that person into your life for you to be a helper to, you'll be more prepared to do it, and, and he'll do that exactly when he desires to do it. But don't sit around and wait, okay? 
Okay, so we see here now that, that we, we know what our identity is, right? We know we're to bear this image of God, we know what our purpose is, we get to be this really strong, really valuable help. But now we really need to talk about our sin. We need to talk about our sin because of the fall. Um, we have this, this sin that we get to deal with every single day um, that really wants to get in the way of us living out our purpose. So God has given us this purpose and, and this is here to just get in our way and thwart the whole thing. And so you know probably the story and you guys gotta remember this isn't just a story, this isn't some mythological thing. This is a huge thing that happened. Adam and Eve were living in the garden. They had that perfect environment. They had a perfect uh, relationship with God. They saw him all the time. They lived with him. He told them not to do that one thing, don't eat of this tree. He didn't tell them that just to give them a rule. He told them for their own good because you know he knew what would happen. They disobeyed and in that disobedience, we got the biggest fracture that has ever happened in all of history. It completely fractured our relationship between us and God, whom we're supposed to bear the image of. And so, because of that fall, um, God had to uh, speak some, some curses or some discipline. These are really the consequences of our sin that he had to give to the man and to the woman. And Gabe talked about it last week with the men that, that God was saying, you know, now it's gonna be really, diff- you're gonna toil at work. It's gonna be hard to do the work that I've given you to do. You're not gonna always enjoy it. And, um, and, and we saw that with men, they tend to then rebel against that and shirk their responsibility, right? Well, for women, this is what God said to us as women in Genesis 3, 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children, which, bummer, that didn't have to hurt. I mean, I haven't had kids, but I'm terrified. And so those of you that have, Good job, but isn't that a bummer? <laughs> that that, that would, like, didn't, have to, it didn't have to be that way. So, um, you know, that's, that's something to look forward to down the road when there'll be no more pain. But the second half of that is what I wanna dial in on is, um, so it's so, okay, so you're gonna have pain in childbearing, and then your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And that's kind of a tricky phrase, um, Another one of those that with, with our language and everything is kind of more difficult to understand because you know, first read it, it's like, well, why would it be bad for your desire to be for your husband? And then why does it say that he would rule over you? Um, what this is, is really just explaining is that what our, our desire now is, is to usurp his role and, and to try to control, try to gain control, try to take the lead and take his role, but he's gonna rule over us. And so what this really is saying is there's gonna be all of this conflict now. So you remember how I said there's this really you know, beautiful cycle, how everything functions really well and each role just really feeds each other and there's all of this love and fruit that can come out of that. Well now, because of our sin, we're at conflict with each other. And so there's this other cycle, this cycle of conflict that is created. Man is called to lead, but like we said last week, he shirks that responsibility. So then the woman wants to take control already, so she's like, perfect, I'm in. I'm just gonna take the lead, get out of my way, I can do it better anyway. She loses respect for him. He then is disrespected, so he continues to rebel not leading and shirking his responsibility. So you see how this goes, it's just this other cycle that is, you know, there's no unity there, there's conflict, there's trouble, there's fighting, there's quarrel, probably nothing's getting done that's very fruitful. We have all of this conflict because of the fall, because of that fracture. And what I want us to see tonight, ladies, is that our sin, our consequences of this that we now have, that we live with, our sin really revolves around us always wanting to have control or to gain control in some way. And what we're really doing is we're craving what we lost in the garden. So if you think about it, God created us, this is what he intended for us, is the way that he created us in the garden in that 
perfect peace with him and unity with him, um, just enjoying him. And we get to have that again, thank, thankfully. Uh, we get to have that again when we go home. But we're craving that, what we had, what he wrote on our hearts in the garden. We had security, right? We had perfect security. We had peace. There was total perfection. There was no trouble. There was no conflict. There were no issues. Uh, it says that they were naked and unashamed. So hello, no body issues, right? No body image problems. How great will that be? But so what we do in missing what we had in the garden, instead of going to God for those things, for our security, for our fulfillment, for peace, we try to take control of our lives and we try to manufacture it ourselves. And so how do we do that? And, and I'm gonna tell you kind of how this all plays out and just preface it that it doesn't matter what age you are, every single woman does this and it doesn't matter how you grew up or um, you know, anything, about, anything about your life. If you are a woman, you do this. And it kind of is a downward spiral that we get into and it starts with comparison. So what we do in this whole quest for control is we wanna check and see how we're doing, right? So we compare ourselves to other women. We're constantly checking out other women, comparing ourselves to see how we're doing. We rank ourselves based on what we see, if we're higher or lower. I mean, I know that it's probably true that some of you, when I walked up here tonight, you took a look and you decided based on something uh, what you thought about me and you ranked yourself you know, higher or lower in that area. This is something that we all do as women and, and we probably, a lot of us do it so much that it's like a subconscious thing. We don't even notice that we're doing it. But guys, I'm really sorry to tell you that women check out other women more often than we check, about, check out men. Um, so you just came out of the gym and you're kind of strutting it because you're feeling really good and, and you know this girl goes by, she's looking at the girl behind you. I mean, she might have noticed you a little bit, but she's checking out the boots of the girl you know, behind you, so I'm sorry to tell you, I'm gonna burst your bubble. But um, there's been several studies that have been done that show that women are constantly checking out other women. In fact, just two days ago, I was at the gym, I was on the stairs, I was listening to a podcast, and I was writing notes for this message. And I was listening to a great podcast that had a lot of the same teaching that we're going through right now from a really great pastor. Um, I'm, I'm working on this message, and this girl walks by, and I was like, dang, I wish my shoulders looked like that. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm writing a message about this right now. And so I noticed it, um, I had to laugh at myself and, and talk to God for a second about it. But, so then I started watching, because I was like on the cardio stuff and I had a really good view of everyone and there were these other women around. And so I just started paying attention for the rest of my time on there. And every time another woman walked into that area, I watched to see like the reaction of other women. And three times it happened, they all checked out. Like somebody else came in and all the girls were like, I mean, one lady did, she was like on the elliptical and she did like one of those. I was like, oh my gosh, it's everywhere. So it's something that like we kind of do it. I mean, she probably didn't even notice that she did it, but I thought, man, I wonder what she's thinking right now. I wonder what she's sizing up and saying like, Oh, look at her hair, or oh, I wish I had hair like her. We compare everything. We compare physical looks like crazy. We compare clothes, though. We compare status. We compare accomplishments, experiences, you now parenting skills. We compare marriages, husbands, everything. We do it all, don't we? And this has always gone on, I mean forever, but holy cow, has social media just taken a huge tank of gasoline and dumped it on that fire, hasn't it? I mean, social media, this world of Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, all of these, um, it is the arena for comparison. And it's like the Hunger Games in there. It's crazy. <laughs> But it is, isn't it? I mean, you look through your feed and you're looking at everyone's experiences and their selfies and their vacations and nobody ever posts like anything, you know, negative about them, right? Like somebody said, I think you're comparing it, you know, your life to someone's highlight reel and that's totally true. 
I mean, nobody posts a selfie like when they just got up in the morning and their hair's all crazy and they have those sleep marks on their face and like dried up pimple cream, you know, and, and dark circles under their eyes. Like nobody's ever seen that selfie before, right? So you're looking into people's lives where all they're doing is churning out as much manufactured, you know, look how great everything is in my whole world, you know, highlight reel. And, and, and it leads to all kinds of issues that we're gonna get into, but I do wanna talk for a minute about some of these things that we do and, 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 and taking selfies and all the things that we're always putting out there. So I really wanna encourage us, all of us, but especially us women, to really pay attention to how we use social media. Because you guys, maybe we don't realize how damaging it can be to ourselves and to each other. Because you know, you go, you take a selfie, nobody just like snaps it, you do it 14 times until you get it exactly like you like and so that you don't have that weird chin thing, you know. And then you, you know, change stuff, you make the lighting all really good and the colors all really good. And I was talking to Rachel the other day who works here at the church and, and she works in the youth and, and I'm a little bit behind on some of this stuff. She was telling me about these apps where you can like, basically you take a selfie and then you can like Photoshop yourself. You know, you can airbrush it and make sure your skin looks perfect um, and then post it. And so there again, like how sad is that though? We're creating a manufactured image of ourselves and putting it out there for people. And the thing you do when you're taking that selfie and, and you're posting it, you're really just saying, okay, now please, everyone, affirm me. Affirm me. Because you post it, and how many times do you look at your phone for notifications from Facebook or Instagram to see how many people like that? And a lot of people, if it doesn't get enough likes, then they take it down. If it doesn't get what they want. You know, your day kind of is like determined by how many likes your selfie gets or your photos, your post. And the funny thing with all that probably is like with apps like that, you're putting out this fake, you know, tweaked, perfected version of yourself. Oftentimes I think those are probably the same girls that would, uh, oh my gosh, this magazine photoshopped that model. Let me talk about it, post a link about how awful that is on my Facebook page. And so I really just want to, I wanna flat out ask you tonight that if you, I don't know what those apps are called that do that, but I wanna flat out ask you tonight that if you are one who has one of those, I just ask you tonight to delete it off your phone. Because you've gotta see that that is doing harm to you for you to say, well, here's a perfected, changed, altered version of myself that I wanna put out there. Maybe people will like that. Maybe that will get me more affirmation. There's nothing but, there's, there's honestly, there's pride in that and you're just causing damage to you, you're being self-focused, and you're causing damage to your relationship with God, or taking your focus off of that. The second thing that happens with that is you're causing damage to other women because you're putting out this fake picture and saying, okay, compare yourself to this. And it, we can't be doing that to each other. And so I just ask you, encourage you, that if that's something that you have, like, no big deal, no shame, but but maybe as a good choice for the future and for your sisters in Christ and for yourself, just delete that and don't use that anymore. We've really gotta pay attention to the way that, that we're using these kind of things, social media, when we know about ourselves that we're a comparison uh, is one of our biggest issues. And I wanted to mention too, and, and here at the church we feel it's really important, we've talked about it, is um, we've gotta pay attention to how we use other media as well. Uh, movies, TV, songs, all that stuff. Uh, because we're not just into comparing ourselves to other women who are you know, right in front of us, we'll compare ourselves to completely fictional women in a movie, or a completely fictional story in a movie, and we'll compare our life to it. And so you've got to be really careful about what you're taking in. And I'll mention, because there's a movie coming out this weekend, Fifty Shades of Grey, you know we're going to talk about it, we're going to go there. But I would encourage you, of course, not to see that again for the same reasons, the damage that it causes to you and what it is that you're supporting. You can't be against sex trafficking you can't be against prostitution, you can't be against domestic violence and abuse and go and watch that movie. 
need to understand that it's on the same playing field. It glorifies domestic abuse. It glorifies a completely non-godly, unbiblical account of a very amazing, beautiful thing, sexual relationship that God has created. It completely distorts that, it abuses that, it abuses the roles that God has given man and woman. And you ought to understand, I know some of you will say, oh, it's just a movie. Yeah, but you're watching two actual people, they're actors, but they're two actual people, you're watching two actual people take off their clothes. That is different, violence in movies is one thing, it's, those are fake explosions, it's fake blood. You're seeing two actual people naked, and um, porn or not, uh, they are at least simulating things that, um, that are not holy, that are not portrayed in the light that God created them very, you know, well, like to be very good, and we're gonna talk about that more next week. But we need to understand what it is. It's not just this, it's not just that. It does have an effect on us. The other thing we do too as women is we have no problem for us gathering up our girlfriends and going to see a movie like that, but then we want to trash on the guys and our boyfriends and our husbands because they have a problem with porn or because they looked at porn. It's hypocrisy. It's the same thing. And so, Something to think about, that's all I'm gonna say about that. We'll talk more about the incredible gift of sex, our sexual uh, relationship, what God has designed for it, because it's, um, it's a very holy, wonderful, biblical thing, and, and Gabe's gonna do a great job with that next week. But. So we've talked about comparison, we understand that's an issue for all of us, so what is the next thing that we do is we've compared ourselves to each other. Uh, as women, well, we rank ourselves against each other, we decide you know, where we stand with the pack kind of thing, and then what do we do? We compete with each other, we try to outdo each other. We try to stand out more than the next, or we identify a, a one girl and we gotta try to outdo her. Our photos gotta get more likes next time. We want to become the one that other women compare themselves to. And so we do what we can to become that, and we compete with each other. As we compete with each other, you know what the prize is that we win from all of this? We gotta have even more insecurity. Awesome, right? We become even more aware of our perceived flaws as we're doing all this comparing and this ranking. All we do is pluck out all the things that we perceive are wrong. And then what do we do? We look for more affirmation. We go after those to fix them. So we start going to the gym every single day. You know, we try all the latest cleanses you know, the crazier, the better, as long as it promises really good results. We'll drink a smoothie made out of like frog intestine extract, you know. But it's organic, so, you know. <laughs> we'll try whatever as long as it promises some really dramatic results and really fast. We'll spend more money, we'll spend money that we don't have trying to get the look that we want. We'll spend the money maybe that we don't have to travel more, or we'll just go to parties more and try new things with the whole purpose of looking like our lives are more exciting. I mean, don't raise your hand, but just think about it. Have you ever gone and done something really just for like, I can take a picture of that and post it and you know, it'll be interesting and exciting. So we grow in our insecurities and as we grow in our insecurities, then we grow discontent and we covet. We get really discontent with where we're at, we get really frustrated, and then we just start saying, well, I wish I had her blank. Wish I had her hair, I wish I had her marriage, I wish I had her thighs, her style, her job, whatever. Whatever that blank is for you, we start coveting. Well, I want what she has. As we go down that road, this turns into jealousy and bitterness. James 4, verse one through three says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You don't have because you don't ask God. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. 
So we don't get what we want, so we get jealous. And then it gets really nasty, because we turn to gossip, we turn to backstabbing, we turn to some really crazy things that God says we ought not do because we can't get what we want. We quarrel, we fight, like it says right now, you kill and you covet. So even if you maybe haven't said it out loud though, you've done it in your heart. Maybe you didn't gossip about that girl, but man, you thought all of it and you really have like this burning jealousy and bitterness towards her where, man, if you could take her down or if you could just be better than her, wouldn't that be great? You could show her. We try to tear each other down to build ourselves up and to feel better about ourselves. We resort to that. We grow in bitterness as well. We grow in bitterness that we aren't getting what we want. And let me tell you something really big and important about bitterness. That bitterness never stays the same size. If left unchecked, bitterness doesn't just stay in this one area of your life. It always grows. It will take over your heart if you leave it alone. It will mess with your relationships, your attitude about everything, and it will cause real damage. Bitterness will always grow if you leave it alone. I should have written it down, I didn't. There's a, a verse in Psalm, and I forget where now, but it says, God says that uh, it is better for a man to go live in the desert than to live at home with his quarrelsome and ill-tempered uh, wife. It's like saying, it is better for you to just go and live out on the border of Utah, out there in the middle of nowhere, with the sagebrush, and maybe you'll have a pet lizard, than it is to live at home with this bitter, quarrelsome wife. It's destructive. It causes damage to other people, outside of just the damage that bitterness does to ourselves. So we see all this, we see this like, this is this downward spiral, right, of, of sin, that we get into as we try to get control. So what do we do about all of this? Because it looks kind of hefty, I know, right now. What do we do about all of this? Well, it's just like Gabe said to you guys last week. We go to the cross. We always, always go to the cross when we have our sin identified, because that is where it's taken care of. Otherwise, we're hopeless, right? Apart from Jesus, we're hopeless. Apart from Jesus, we're stuck in that awful downward spiral, clawing and fighting, trying to get some control, chasing after a mirage. If you don't know Jesus, you're here tonight. Welcome, first of all. So glad that you're here. And, and really listen to what I'm saying here as we talk about this next part because with Jesus, we are never, ever stuck. With Jesus, we're never, ever stuck in our sin. Whatever you're dealing with, whatever you struggle with, whatever your junk is, with Jesus, you're never, ever stuck there. It's not ever hopeless. And if you've been believing that, then you've been believing a lie, and you need to hear that tonight. It is an absolute lie, literally from the pit of hell, and I encourage you to reject that tonight as we talk about the gospel. And we're gonna talk about it in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter one, um, verse four through eight. I'm just gonna read this. There's so much packed into four verses here. I'm gonna read it and then we'll go back through and we'll break it down. It says, for he chose us, God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance, with his in his accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. You guys, there's so much rich, just pure gospel right here, it's awesome. So let's go, let's go walk through this a little bit more. God chose us in him before the creation of the world. So before he even made Adam and Eve, 
and everything else that we know, everything that we understand and are familiar with, he knew us, he chose us, he knew what he was going to do by making us. And he chose us in him to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now we see, you know, we just talked about, we know we're not holy and blameless. But he chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight, and that means he's not gonna have it any other way. And so we read on, it says that he predestined us to be adopted as his sons. And we can say daughters there, it just means people. So he predestined us to be adopted as his daughters through Christ Jesus. So he knew we were gonna break that relationship with him. Jesus was never a plan B. There was never like, well now what do I do? He knew and he had a plan before any of us were ever even made, before any of that ever went down, before that fracture ever even happened. And he said, I will have you as my sons and my daughters and I will do it through my son, Jesus Christ, who he gave us in his pleasure in accordance with his good will. God is so incredibly good that he gave us Jesus to deal with this so that we could be restored in wholeness of our identity to him. We see that we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of all these sins we just talked about. Forgiveness of every sin that you have ever committed, every, every sin you committed today, every one you ever will commit. Think about that just for you, just for me, that is a ton. He did that for every person who's ever lived and who ever will live. And Jesus got on the cross and he paid that penalty for us. Because sin always leads to death, always. That is the penalty, that is the consequence of sin. We talked about that downward spiral and like I said, apart from Jesus, it just keeps leading into that junk and it leads to death. With Jesus, we have incredible hope of the redemption through his blood. As he got up there, he took our our penalty, he paid the price for us, he took death, and then he completely overcame death. He stomped it by coming back three days later, completely conquering it for us. And so we now get to enjoy the riches of God's grace that he lavished. I love that it uses that word, he lavished. God's grace on us. That is amazing that we have a God that is that good. He is better than anything we can even imagine. He is that good. And so we see three huge things here in this text. Jesus has freed us from the bondage of sin so that we can live out that purpose. So ladies, Jesus has freed us from the bondage of all of that junk so that we can live out our purpose and the individual calling that he has for you and the purpose he has given us to be that very strong, valuable, helpful strength in the church and to our spouses and in the body of Christ. Two, we see that Jesus has restored our identity as daughters and image bearers of God. He's brought us back and he said, I am giving you, this is your identity. I am adopting you, or my daughter, and you bear my image in the world. And three, then he gives us the grace that we need, that he lavishes on us. Remember, we, that grace, we have that now and today to battle the sin that still wants to distract us. Because you know, right, once you, you get saved, sin just doesn't go away, it's no problem. We'll get to experience that. I'm looking forward to it when we go home It won't be an issue anymore. But while we're here, we have that sin that still wants to distract us. It still wants to grab and poke at us and try to distract us from living out our purpose and our call and our identity. But he gives us grace upon grace upon grace every single day to walk in that battle. So again, you're not stuck. And you don't have to play the game that our culture tells you to play. Worship team, you guys can come up. While they do that, I just wanna tell you guys a quick story of what God has been talking to me about and what he's been teaching me in the last year because I think it'll help you, I hope it'll help you. But it was last winter, a year ago, um, God really started talking to me about some things that he was like, we, we need to deal with this. Some things that had always been there. 
and he really convicted me and showed me that, that oh, I have all these people in my life, I have a lot of really amazing friends and family, and, and there's nothing wrong with that in community, but what I was doing is I was depending on those people in a way that I shouldn't. I was putting uh, dependence on them that only belonged to God. And, and he made it very clear, and I saw it as this string, this chain of people that I went to for my security, and I went to and asked, basically, asked these people to fulfill me in ways that only God could. And when I compared myself to someone else and thought, oh, well, I don't have that, but I have, I have you know, my person or the, these people. And so I was depending on people where I should have been uh, depending on God. And so I was really convicted by this, and like, oh yeah, I, I see this, God, and I wanna deal with it, I want it gone. So I saw, he gave me this picture of, you know, this chain of people, and I'd always done this, I'd always been this way, so I was like, okay, God, you've gotta break this chain. I was praying that he would break this chain, because so it's like, I've always been this way, I don't know how to do it differently, so I pray that you would just come in and break this thing. And he did something that I didn't expect him to do, he took my picture of this chain of people, and the guys redrew it for me. And he said, okay, I, I don't need to break your chain. I'm just gonna add this last link to it. And it's this red infinity symbol. And he said, it's not that you need to stop doing those things. It's that you need to put it all in me. He said, I am the only one who can give you security and who can fulfill you perfectly always, every single day, stretched out to forever. So he said, what you're doing is just misplaced. You need to place all of your hope, all of your security, all of your need in me. And that just totally floored me, that we have a God that is so good, that wasn't just like, stop doing that, stop doing that, stop doing that. He said, depend on me, come to me. I will fulfill everything you need forever, I'm the only one that can do it perfectly. And so tonight, ladies, and I would say this is, this is for everyone, but maybe go home and journal and think about this. I really want you to think about what is that for you? What are your links? Like right, like I can tell you I want what I can tell you all kinds of names. But for you, maybe not people, but um, the, the things look to for fulfillment, that you look to for security, that you look to peace and for hope apart from God. That as the Holy Spirit is talking to you, let's just repent. Let's repent and let go of all of that stuff, all that rat race of comparing and, and trying to compete with each other and take each other down, trying to gain control and make for ourselves what we want. Let's just lay it all down at the foot of the cross that Jesus paid for all of that. Let's repent of it, turn to him. Take up our identity as a daughter of God. And as we see that, I want you to just enjoy him and just worship him tonight. So let's worship him.